What is going on everyone? Anthony Drew Gary here, host of The How To Show, where we talk about optimizing life, money, and happiness one how to at a time. In last week's episode, I spent some time talking about what it might look like to house hack. And what I mean by that is taking a house uh, that you live in, and let's say there's some extra bedrooms in that house, and what might it look like to rent those ha- those rooms out in such a way that it would provide extra income for you and your family. And so I want to take this week and bring on a special guest to talk about what it looks like to take that house hacking strategy and scale it to numbers that you aren't going to believe you're hearing when we talk about them. So I had the ability to interview Todd Baldwin this week. He was on the Bigger Pockets podcast a couple of weeks ago, and for one stroke of luck for yours truly, I sent him a message on Instagram, and he responded, and he was willing to, to spend some time chatting with me. And so we're going to talk about Todd's story and what he did to get to a point where he's not only house hacking the house he lived in, the house he currently lives in, and other houses as well in a market that allows him to make substantial income in such a way that also provides a tremendous amount of value for the folks that rent from him. So I can't tell his story any better than he can tell it. Without further ado, let's bring Todd onto the show. Todd Baldwin, welcome to the How To Show. I I really thank you for joining me today. Hey, awesome. Thank you so much for having me on. It is a pleasure to be here and I'm excited. This is going to be a good episode. Very cool, my man. So talk to me about your your world and, and how you got into real estate in the first place. What got you interested? Uh, was, was there something that, that you saw growing up or how, how did you get interested in the idea as a, a way to, to earn money or to, to make a, a career for yourself? Yeah, great question. So um, kind of going way back, I do come from a low income family. Um, I was raised by a single mother who, you know, I watched her struggle to put food on the table for three kids. And uh, she was always afraid about finances. And we were always kind of concerned about money. And I just learned from a very young age that financial independence is something that I needed and wanted in my life. So I started working uh, when I was 12. I started my first business when I was 15. Um, learned how to start making money online when I was about 19. And then I ended up buying my first property when I was 23, I believe. Um, but yeah, I mean, just reading books growing up, a lot of stuff by Warren Buffett, um, everything by Robert Kiyosaki, just this idea that there are people out there who not only have a lot of money, but are also making money while they sleep. That was completely foreign to me. And it's something that I just, I was obsessed with as a kid. And, um, now as an adult, I have a lot of that and it's been great. Yeah, it makes total sense. You know, getting, uh, getting those mentors in your life, even if it's through, through books or through listening to podcasts, uh, it's good to have those sort of influences uh, showing you what you can do. And, and so it sounds like you got yourself in at about 23, you bought your first property. What did that look like uh, when you very first got started? Sure. So um, my girlfriend at the time, who now we're married, but we were looking to live together. And uh, apartments in Seattle are just astronomically through the roof. And at the time, I was uh, 22 or 23. I had a six-figure sales job. So I was making good money, and she was making really good money too. And still, even we didn't want to go out and spend a boatload of cash on an apartment. So we decided to buy a house. And at the time, it was just the two of us, no pets, no kids, not even a plant. And um, we didn't need an entire big house to ourselves. It was a six-bedroom, four-bathroom house. So we occupied the master bedroom and then we house hacked the rest. We opened up the bedrooms to uh, my college buddies. And as it stands, we were able to live in a brand new house completely for free because our roommates paid off the mortgage taxes and insurance each and every month. That is awesome. So again, to to reiterate, this is is an idea of house hacking where Mm -hmm. Portions of the house are, are rented out. And in this instance, you were living in a house. But to take a step back, you talked about this house being six bedrooms. So yes. I, I can't imagine that you and your, your girlfriend and now your wife at the time were looking at this house saying, hey, this six bedroom house is for us. We love it. We're going to live here. You had to have had this mindset going into it, right? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we found the house and we liked the house for sure. 
And, uh, you know, it, it, what's funny is we actually argue about whose idea it was to rent out the bedroom. She believes that it was her idea and I believe that it was my idea. I'm going to go ahead and say it was my idea. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, once we figured that, it, it was so much space. It was three stories. It had a three-car garage. It just The two of us didn't need all that space. So we did want to monetize it in some way. And uh, house hacking seemed to be the way to do it. Okay. So talk me through a little bit of the, the preliminary numbers here. So when you rented out a bedroom in this house, what did a bedroom rent out for? And if you could sort of frame that as compared to what did a one bedroom apartment in that area rent out for at the time so that we can, you know, just get some comparison for, for whether or not this is you know, feasible everywhere or if it, uh, if it was only specific to your location or, and, and really just to, to show whether or not this was a value to the, to the college buddies at the time, but to the tenants overall that are thinking about living in, in this sort of a situation? Yeah, good question. So when I, I bought that first house hack, we rented out the rooms and now we're up to six properties and between all six, my average room goes for $900 per month. So every property that I own is rented out by the bedroom. Going back to when I was just dating my, my current wife, or my now wife, <clears throat> we were looking at living together for the first time and a one bedroom, one bath that we found was going to be 2,700 bucks a month all in. Um, and that, that's, you know, if you include parking and utilities. Uh, so even though I had a six figure income and even though she was doing really well, we didn't, we couldn't rationalize spending $2,700 a month on a place that we didn't even own. So we bought this house and started advertising rooms for 900 bucks. And there are a lot of people who didn't make six figures that thought, well, man, like this is a great deal because all utilities included. We do have a house cleaner that goes through every single house. Um, so they have a maid, we have pest control. So people are actually stoked to spend 900 bucks on a bedroom when a one bedroom apartment is 2,700 and even a studio apartment in Seattle is like $2,200. Absolutely. So your value proposition is, is inherent from the very beginning. You're charging anywhere from half to a third of what comparable, you know, multifamily projects would be charging in this area. And it sounds to me like you found a way to add some additional value. Talk to me a little bit more about, you know, you, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned pest control, but I'm really interested about you. You talked about cleaning services. Mm -hmm. how, how does that work? Sure. Yeah. So first, let me just say another value add is all of our properties are brand new construction. So they're all really nice and really new. Um, but we do have a house cleaner. She goes to all six houses and she cleans each house from top to bottom every single week. And she'll scrub the toilets and the shower. She'll clean the oven, the microwave. She will vacuum the stairs and mop the floors. And we did this because that the number one thing roommates, or the number one thing that roommates fight about is mess. So we figured if we just eliminate that fight before it ever happens, that will be in our best interest. Um, and then we have pest control come once a quarter just to make sure that no bugs get in the house. Um, we also stock each and every house with toilet paper, paper towels, hand soap, dish soap, and uh, Clorox wipes, as well as garbage bags. Because if you are constantly buying soap for the bathroom, but your roommate is always using it up and never paying you back, eventually it's going to be annoying to you. So we decided to supply all of that. Pretty much the only thing we don't supply is like personal laundry show up and your shampoo. Um, but so we, we want it to be a relatively seamless system. Okay. So you are taking basically all of the pain points out of living with somebody else out of this equation. And it sounds to me like you're still able to provide a value to those tenants. And obviously you're still able to make the numbers work so that this is worth your time doing it, right? Absolutely. So, you know, a, a lot of questions that I have is, man, why do you have a maid? You could make so much more money if you cut out that expense or, you know, why do you supply all utilities? Because we have every house has like a house Netflix account, a house Hulu account. We give them HBO. And um, the thing is, first of all, we're already collecting about $40,000 per month in rent after all of the uh, principal interest taxes and insurance after all utilities across every house. We're still netting around $13,000 per month. So, you know, passive six figure cash flow right there. And although a case could be made that we could make a little bit more if we didn't have it made or we didn't provide HBO or whatever, we're not here to nickel and dime anyone. And also, I don't know that I could charge as much for the bedrooms if I didn't have it made. Um, you know, I mean, I mentioned the average bedroom goes for 900, but we do have rooms that go for 1300. These master bedrooms with big, beautiful soaking tubs and two sinks. 
people are paying us 1300 bucks and we have six of those rooms uh, rented out right now. And so I don't think we could command those high of rents if we didn't offer a lot of perks because at the end of the day, you are living with five other people. Yeah, your, your methods to, to add value, that's incredible. I, I would have never even thought that these houses come with, you know, they come with premium TV channels. So did, did, you, did you start with a business plan or anything that, that documented all of the different ways you wanted to add value? Or are these things you learned along the way and you got feedback and, and really paint the picture as to, to how long it took you to get your, your processes in place to make this what, what really seems to be the well-oiled machine that it is now? Yeah, good question. So kind of both. I mean, when we bought our first house and decided to rent out the rooms, um, we knew that all utilities would be included because we were living in that house and we were going to pay for the utilities no matter what. So instead of dividing up receipts and trying to figure out like, oh, well, who showers more and who leave their bedroom light on? We just figured, let's just charge a premium for the bedroom and they will pay one price every month and it will include everything. There's no dividing receipts. There's no trying to calculate anything like that. It's just so much smoother that way. And um, for our own house, we knew we wanted a good cable package. We knew we wanted high-speed internet with unlimited data. Um, we hired a, a housekeeper for actually every other week. And shortly thereafter, we bumped it up to once per week. Um, but no, I mean, you, you kind of learn as you go. Another thing we do is every single house has a second refrigerator. Some houses also have a chest freezer, like a standalone chest freezer. And then everybody gets their own cabinet in the kitchen with their name on it. They also get a pantry shelf with their name on it. And um, we just try to be as organized as possible. And it just really does help with the cohesiveness. Uh, that's, that's incredible. And I, I love the structure behind what you're doing and why you're doing it. It all makes sense in terms of making it, that experience as good for that tenant as you can. So let, let's take that a step further. You know, you've got some of these houses. So what, what's the low number and the high number of how many people are living in any given house that you're running? Sure. So our biggest house is an eight bedroom, four bathroom house. Okay. We, so that's, that's our biggest. And we actually do have a couple of other houses with the same number of people living in there. And our lowest house is six bedroom, three bathrooms. Okay. So we have uh, basically on the low end, it's six on the high end, it's eight. And, and so in, in the Seattle market, is it easy to come across houses with this, these many bedrooms? Cause I, I can tell you in Indianapolis where I'm at, if you want to find six or eight bedrooms, uh, you're going into communities that are uh, as affluent as they get in our neighborhood. And, and for the most part, it's, it's just not something you come across to, in this area. So how are you finding these? Sure. Well, so our first deal, we bought new construction directly from a builder. We did not use a real estate agent. And um, we have done four total deals with that same builder. So, um, you know, we, we, have, we can basically work with the builder to talk about, you know, what we're interested in buying and what floor plans they have available. Um, so that was uh, lucky there. And then the second two, or not the second two, but the other two houses that we didn't use a builder for, one is the duplex that I live in now. My half is a three bedroom, two and a half bath. Um, the other half is two bedroom, two and a half bath. And then we also have a studio apartment downstairs. And then the other is that eight bedroom, four bathroom home. So, you know, they, I agree, like they, they are, they sell the market is expensive, right? Because I bought in an undervalued neighborhood that's going through a transition. We're about 20 minutes from downtown by bus. But even my first house was over half a million dollars. I think it was $506,000 in an undervalued neighborhood. Now today that house is worth, you know, closer to 700 grand. So it's, it's great, the appreciation is amazing. But yes, it is a very expensive market, which is why this strategy works so well. Now, that makes a lot of sense. And so you've got this scenario where you've either got six or eight tenants living in a house. What sort of uh, protocols do you have in place to make sure that, you know, as best you can, you're vetting these, these prospects to, to make sure that you're going to have amicability amongst the folks that are living in these houses? Are you doing anything to make sure that you, you try to, to keep, you know, similar minded folks or folks that work similar hours or even, you know, uh, are, are you separating them by gender? Are you doing anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a few options. So we do have one all female house. We have one all male house and then we have four mixed houses. And um, within any given house, we do our best to try to match by personality. Um, it doesn't work out 100% of the time that way, but we do try to do a good job. So if someone, you know, applies for like, you know, I get a particular house and based on that conversation, what I learned from them is they would be a better fit for a different house. 
I let them know. And I say, hey, this is the house you want. We're talking about this. And I'm happy to show it to you. But I also think you'd make a better fit for the house around the corner. Do you want to go take a look at that and, and see if you like it? And usually that, that comes across pretty well. That, that's well received because they want to be happy too. You know, they want to be happy in a home that they're living in. So we do do that. Obviously, everybody has to pass a background check um, and a criminal history and all that stuff. Um, and there has been a few cases where sometimes somebody will come in because they want to save money as opposed to an apartment. But what they learn about themselves is they're not the type of person that can really handle living with roommates. And so there has been, I think, four or five people that I've had to sort of non-renew or just help realize that this isn't the best fit for them. But most of the time it works out great. Okay. So are you typically running 12 month leases? How does that part look? And follow up question to that. Uh, it, is your density limited to one person per bedroom or what happens when you've, you've got a, a couple who wants to explore this sort of option? Great questions. So let's start with the leases. So let's say um, my average home is a six bedroom home. What I actually do is I stagger the leases. So two of the bedrooms I will have on six months, two of the bedrooms I'll have on nine months, and the last two bedrooms I'll have on 12 months. But then I renew everybody at 12 months. So that way, at any given time, any particular house, I'm only coming up with two leases at a time that are up for renewal. And that just makes it easier for me. So I'm not trying to fill a six bedroom house all in the same month, but just easier for placing tenants. Um, at, in the city that I live in, uh, the rule is you can have two people per bedroom plus one. So in a six bedroom house, you can have two people per bedroom for a total of 12 plus one for a total of 13. Um, when it comes to couples or living with a partner, I really only allow that in a master bedroom where they have their own bathroom. And that is because if you're already sharing a bathroom with three other people, adding another person to that bathroom won't be fun. So couples are for sure allowed, but I, I typically try to do that in a master bedroom or in like a studio, something where they have their own private bathroom. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I think that's a good way to do it. And the, the way that you stagger your leases so that you're not trying to fill full houses at the same time, that's absolutely brilliant. So I commend you for that. Thank you. It has been, I mean, you know, to put it in perspective, so we bought our first home mid-December of 2015. We had all the rooms rented out and tenants moved in on January 1st. And from January 1st to today, across six rooms and 35 houses, we have never missed a single month's rent. We haven't even missed a day's rent. And it's because we stagger the leases, we're aggressive in our marketing approach, and there's such high demand for it. Like even today, the day that we're recording this podcast, I had a girl move out of one of my houses this morning, and I have a new girl moving into her same bed, that same bedroom this afternoon. So it's, it's so like back to back because Seattle's crazy expensive. It's only blown up since we bought the first house and um, it's just, it, it works out pretty well. That is incredible. And so it, it sounds like you're really active in your, your marketing and your leasing. Are you personally showing these units to the prospects or do you have somebody on, on staff or on call that does that for you? What's that look like? And I actually do all of it. Okay. And so I, I've got to imagine that that keeps you busy enough that you're not still doing that sales job you talked about. <laughs> you know, I did take a break from my sales job, but not for the reason you'd think. Um, so before the coronavirus pandemic and this duplex we were living in, we had the other half of the duplex on Airbnb and also that, uh, that garage studio, we had that on Airbnb as well. So I took some time off of work to really vamp up our Airbnb business because that is a lot more hands-on because you could have a different guest every single night. So we were doing great on Airbnb. We were super host with about a hundred five-star reviews and making money hand over fist. And then the coronavirus pandemic happened and people stopped traveling. So we've since pivoted and leased out those units just on a longer term. Um, but no, I was, I mean, I was working a full-time sales job while I was doing this room rental stuff. And uh, the, the good news is once you have a house set up, it doesn't take that much time or energy, probably an average of like five hours a week. Now there are some days where I'll work 12 or 13 hours just straight on real estate, but then there could be three or four months where there's nothing for me to do because most people do resign. I'm not turning over these rooms too crazy much. Most people resign. Um, sometimes they don't, but we also get a lot of referrals. So people that live in our houses who enjoy living there, if they have a buddy or a friend that needs a room to rent, they'll refer them to me. So we place a lot of people that way. And I also have a lot of repeat tenants where I've had people rent a room from me and they move out to live with their girlfriend or their boyfriend, or maybe they just want to experience living alone. 
and then they'll actually move back. Like they'll come back if it doesn't work out the way they thought it uh, does. It's probably happened five or six times where someone's moved out and then come back. So we do, um, you know, we're, we're busy, but it's not overwhelming or anything like that. Yeah, I think all of that makes sense. And I think it all dials back to the fact that you're providing a value that's leaps and bounds above what you could get out of the, the local apartment rental market or even, you know, trying to rent a house by yourself and, and fill it house hacking style. Like I talked about in my last week's video, you're, you're providing all of that work for them at a flat rate. And so I, I think that it makes total sense that, uh, that you're not missing out on any vacancy and that it's always full. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about, you know, what, what's next for you? Uh, Todd, I, you and you and your wife looking to, to scale this to a certain extent and then, you know, retire to an Island or are you looking to, what, what's your, what's your next steps? What's your, what's your, maybe your exit plan? What's the future hold for this sort of style as a means for employment and financial independence? Sure. So first of all, if anyone's looking to get started in real estate, I think house hacking is a brilliant way to start. Um, we will be moving into multifamily. So I do plan to buy an apartment building. My goal is to, by the time I'm 60, have 6,000 units. So very aggressive goals. Um, the reason for that is, um, although the house hacking is way more lucrative than any other thing you'll find, uh, and I really do believe that, um, it's not as scalable. So we have six houses and 35 tenants. I don't know if we could add you know, five more houses. But I could buy a 400 unit apartment building and hire a management company and be completely hands off. That's just a lot more scalable, less overall profitable, but uh, much, it's just easier to scale that way. Um, I also recently started a YouTube channel. So I'm teaching house hacking, financial literacy, pretty much just anything that, that has to do with making money and, and investing money. Um, so I'm working on that quite a bit. But yeah, I mean, we want to buy, we wanted to buy an apartment building this year but we're probably looking at 2021 before we actually are able to get one. Okay. Well, that's fantastic. I'll make sure to link to your YouTube channel. And I think that's definitely admirable as you continue to scale upward and it gets you an, an opportunity to, to take maybe a little bit more of a hands-off approach so that you can work on some of these passion projects. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're not so different, you and I, in the sense that uh, both grew up in, in homes. It sounds like you, you grew up in a home where you rented as did I and, you know, made it to a point where, where you had enough cash flow to get yourself into investment real estate and just to continue that process. And I think the ability to teach others that what you're doing is replicable, you know, even if, if someone's living in a market that, that renting by the room doesn't make sense at the scale in which you're doing it, the, that you can get creative and think outside of what's typically being done to provide someone a value and, and learn a skill that, that sets you apart from what other people are doing. And I just want to commend you for that again, Todd. I think you, you're absolutely killing it. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And no, I, I'm a fan of your channel. And I know you come from, you know, humble beginnings and you've done a lot of great things. And yeah, I think the, you know, at the, at the bare minimum, if people want to get into real estate, just buying a house for, to live in and then renting out the bedrooms to offset that cost. It's such a great way to start. I mean, my first deal when I was a rookie, right, we're talking about my first house, we are getting a 100% cash on cash return on just on that first deal. And, you know, a lot of people who invest are trying to make, you know, 10% or if it's really good, they're trying to make 15%. We're getting 100% cash from cash return, not to mention the appreciation and the equity pay down. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. These numbers are wild. I have a house um, where after the, the principal interest tax and insurance, after all the utilities, we're cash flowing $4,000 per month on just one house, one single family home. And um, it's still a great deal for the tenants because they're paying a half or a third of what they would pay in their own apartment. So it's very mutually beneficial. It works out well. And um, yeah, I mean, it just, it just makes sense. Yeah. Let, let's, let's actually dive into that for a minute. Cause you, you took a position when you first started out in, in real estate and really just finding yourself a place to live that you were willing to humble yourself and not, not really care about what anybody thought about what you were doing. No, no, uh, no thoughts behind the judgment of you're having other people live in your house. And, and mm -hmm. you know, that that's countercultural to what maybe you would consider the American dream of having your own house and your own backyard and, and a dog and 2.5 kids. Right. And so just thinking about that, it just a mindset shift that's allowed you to grow really exponentially. And, and I just talk a little bit about that. Yeah. You know, I think that's so big and something that I probably do get the most, flack for, to be honest. Um, you know, I was in an article on CNBC and that went pretty viral and people were 
saying I was insane for letting my roommates or, you know, I was just like greedy or whatever. But honestly, I mean, I, being transparent, I do eventually want a nice house to myself. I mean, my kids are going to grow up in a mansion on the water. I've, I've never, I never tried to hide that. And I will someday drive the Tesla Roadster. Mm -hmm. But for now, you know, living with roommates and driving my 11 year old Ford Focus is fine. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when, when, when I'm, so I'm 28 now mm -hmm. and I'll probably be buying my lake house next year. And if someone comes to me and asks, Oh my gosh, how on earth are you? 30 years old, living in a mansion on the lake, I will tell them it's because for four and a half years, I lived with roommates. And when I was making a hundred grand a year, I didn't buy a BMW. When I was making 200 grand a year, I wasn't going out to eat. When I was making half a million dollars a year, you know, I was still living with roommates. And once my net worth crossed 1.2 million, I had six roommates at the time. My wife and I were sharing one car, which we actually are still sharing one car. And so it's about delayed gratification. It's about being able to stay humble and not having to go for the flashy things. And yes, it would be fun to go out and buy a Rolls Royce tomorrow. <laughs> like it would be fun, but it just wouldn't make any sense. Not for what our long-term goals are. Todd, I think you are a fantastic case study and what can be done if you have the patience, the perseverance, and a little bit of know-how to get some stuff done. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Absolutely. So let's go ahead and shift gears if you don't mind. Uh, are you ready for some rapid style questions that, that cover the how-to cues? Yes, sir. Let's do it. Fantastic, Todd. Question number one, what is the best book you've read in the last 12 months? Rich Dad, Poor Dad. All righty. We'll link to that in the show notes. That's a popular one. I, if anybody's watching this video and you've not read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, go pick it up at your local library or go order it off of your Amazon queue. Well worth your time. Read it every year. It's a good one for sure. Yeah, this is not the first time I've read it, by the way, but it is the best one I've read in 12 months. That's right. So what is one podcast you're subscribed to? Bigger Pockets. That is fantastic. As a matter of fact, that's how uh, I got connected with you. Bigger Pockets. Uh, I heard you live and and I just, you know, I became enamored with the story behind what you did. And, and for whatever reason, I messaged you on Instagram and here we are talking about it. So again, thank right. you for doing that. Mm -hmm. All right. What is the best purchase you've made recently of less than a hundred dollars that's added value to your life? Oh my gosh. I know this is supposed to be rapid fire. I'm sorry. Um, a tie. Okay. I'll take it. <laughs> just a regular tie. You still wear a tie? That, that's good. I went to a wedding recently, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you were able to do that. Fantastic. Yes. What time did you get up this morning? 6 a.m. All right. What color is your toothbrush? White and blue. Yeah, this is a fun question, just to see how many people can recall it. And one last question, where can people find out more about you? Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Todd J Baldwin. Um, I do my best to respond to every DM. I'm not super quick anymore because I had literally thousands of messages after bigger pockets. Mm -hmm. And then you guys can also check out my content on YouTube. It's just my name, Todd Baldwin, where I teach all, all about house hacking, secret shopping, stock investing, all that stuff. Very cool. We'll link to all of those in the show notes. And Todd, thanks again for joining me on the how to show. Perfect. Hey, thanks for having me. And yeah, it was a blast. And I look forward to talking to you again sometime. All right. Thanks. All right. If you didn't take that episode and listen to it through and have some idea of a goal that's in mind for you or something that you want to achieve and, and it didn't give you the motivation to help you take some next steps on it, I'm not sure you've got a pulse because Todd absolutely nailed it. His story's relatable. You know, he comes from humble beginnings. He comes from a scenario where he wanted to improve and change his family tree, and he did it. He did it quickly, and he did it responsibly, intelligently, and just an overall well done for Todd, and I am really thankful that I got to, to interview him. And so that's going to bring this episode of the show to a close. As always, feel free to interact with me. Like this video so that the YouTube algorithm knows that it's a good one for other people to watch and subscribe to the channel so that you can be the first to know about new videos as they come out each week. And if you have any feedback for me or for Todd, leave a comment so that, uh, that I can respond to it or Todd can do the same. And go check out Todd's YouTube channel. Again, the link to that's in the show notes. If you've got any ideas for future topics for the How To Show, leave a comment for that as well. I enjoy reading and interacting with those. Until next time, this is Anthony Drew Gary, host of the How To Show, signing off.